All right, let me hear you. Good morning, Faith Bible Chapel. All right, you're a little bit more awake than first service. I can tell you that. Good job. Well, good morning. We're so glad to have you here. We're excited for this morning. Uh, we get to do our Convoy of Hope one day. And a couple things even just going on this summer. We're excited about the men's barbecue. How many of you guys have signed up for the men's barbecue so far to come here? Carl Mecklenburg. Yeah, anybody? Any, no Broncos fans. I knew it. This is a, this is a Kansas City Chief crowd, right? Oh, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm just saying. All right, but don't forget, men, that we have the barbecue this week, so make sure to sign up uh, and come and participate in that. It's going to be a, a great time. That's on Friday uh, with Carl Mecklenburg. It's going to be a great time together. But today, we're going to be with Convoy of Hope. We've got a couple amazing people from Convoy of Hope. We have Brian McLeese here and Eddie Rince here. We're excited to have you guys. Um, Brian's going to come, here, come up here in a moment and just share a story or two about what Convoy is doing. But Convoy is someone that we've partnered with for years. We see the reach that they have to go out into the world and do some amazing things. Uh, Brian has been a resident of Colorado 29 years up in the Loveland area, been a part of the Fort Collins network up there for a long time, good friends of the church. We love having him here. And so he's going to come up and share a minute. But we just wanted to start out by just showing a quick video about everything that Convoy is doing right now. So why don't you turn your attention to the screens. For years, people around the world and right here in our own communities have turned to one Springfield, Missouri-based organization in their time of need. For some, it's been a meal, a drink of water, emergency supplies, all demonstrating the love of Christ and delivered to them by someone from Convoy of Hope. Hal Donaldson, the founder and president of Convoy, distributed the first bags of groceries out of the back of a pickup truck nearly 25 years ago. And since then, Convoy of Hope has added a fleet of semi-trucks, the expertise of industry leaders, and the hard work and joy of tens of thousands of volunteers, all focused on one mission, bringing hope to people in need. Today, Convoy of Hope feeds more than 177,000 children in 11 countries. They've trained more than 10,000 women and helped them start businesses and have instructed more than 16,000 farmers in agriculture best practices, enabling them to provide for themselves and their families. In addition, Convoy works with cities and churches all across the U.S. to host community events. All around the world, the results of Convoy of Hope's disaster relief work have been nothing short of amazing. From ground zero after 9-11, to an earthquake and tsunami in Japan, and then back to New York after Superstorm Sandy, Convoy of Hope has been there when we've needed them. Through each of these opportunities to serve, one strategy plays out each time, their partnership with the local church. One of the things I most appreciate about Convoy is its passion and commitment to the local church. Their focus on the local church sets it apart. I watched the value of Convoy interfacing, connecting with the local church so that ministry goes on long after the cameras stop rolling and the headlines have moved on. Every year since 2002, Convoy of Hope has received the highest possible rating by industry watchdog Charity Navigator, putting them in the top 1% of charities rated when it comes to financial health, accountability, and transparency. It's because of that reputation that others have joined the cause. Hey guys, it's Zendaya here. Hi, I'm Drew Brees. Convoy of Hope is here handing out coats, blankets, food, water. Real help for real victims. So much help from Convoy of Hope. Not the first time we've seen them in action. Yeah. They are there when you need them. For nearly 25 years, local churches have helped provide the support and prayer that Convoy of Hope has needed. Through that support, hope has been delivered to more than 100 million people in 115 countries all around the world. An incredible story with many chapters yet to be written. Good morning. <laughs> I'm, I'm Brian from Loveland, and uh, Broncos training camp has started. The, uh, the Rockies, right, Carlos, are about to sweep the A's. And I, I get to be at Faith Bible Chapel this morning. This is like a great weekend. <laughs> So recently, I just got to spend a, a few days uh, enjoying and, and training and being in vision along with uh, pastors 
Jason and Cheryl, my wife Barbara and I, have just completely fallen in love uh, with your leadership. And uh, our son, Hank, had a great time getting to know Seth and Ellie. I have pictures of, of us uh, renting 12 bicycles, riding way too far in the hot sun, and, and then finding the perfect beach to swim in <laughs> on, a, on one of the breaks. And gosh, they're just so genuine with everyone they encounter in sharing the love of Jesus. Uh, you guys must be doing something right to have pastors like that. <laughs> so I, I'm just here to give you a quick update, a story of thanks to you uh, from when we were here last year in July and Hal Donaldson shared and we passed out a book called Your Next 24 Hours, if anyone remembers. that um, Little did we know that what you guys did set some things in motion the very next month, we were able to s respond to Hurricane Harvey down in Houston and rolled over uh, 145 semi-loads and then started seeing that things were going to emerge in Florida with Irma. And we just sang, you're never going to let me down. And we're all brave when we're singing that here together, aren't we? But how many know in real life, when you step out of here, there's times where it looks like you're about to get let down. <laughs> I'm sure that's the way it felt to the disciples when Jesus said, well, what do you have? And a little boy produced his lunch. In terms of the magnitude of the, of the need, Harvey, Irma, Maria, earthquake in Mexico, flooding in Bangladesh, all concurrent. It, it feels like a little boy's lunch. So I wanna thank you, not just for your generosity, but for your intercession. Uh, because as we continue to share, we watch the warehouse supply do this. You know what I'm saying? And yet, God said, keep going. So when we got to Florida and we started giving the, the, the remainder of what was in the warehouse, we got a call from FEMA and said, we can't match the amount of volunteer power that you're uh, gathering together through local churches. Can, can we ask you something? If we resource you, would you take point for all the disaster response in Florida for the next six weeks? And they supplied us. Yeah. That, as you know, your veterans to this story, went to resource local churches in the advance of Jesus' gospel, multiplied thousands of times. It led to this moment. Can, can we pray with you right now? So that's what you're mobilizing. That's what your, your one day's wage did. Even though multiplied by corporate sponsors, it still seems small. But Jesus is with us, you guys, thanks to you. God bless you this morning. Thank you, Brian. What a, it's always good to hear the reports on what the Lord is doing. And, and we have a great speaker this morning. Pastor Eddie Rince is going to be speaking with us. He's the national spokesman and national director for the Hispanic and Ethnic Initiative for Convoy of Hope. Eddie is a gifted communicator, and as Eddie and I were talking this morning, he has done, I think, every job possible in the church and in the ministry. He's been a youth pastor. He's been a church planner. He's been a college pastor. He's been a college campus pastor. He's held national positions that oversaw more than 300,000 junior high and high school students. He also serves as the vice president of justice for the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. And Eddie has been married to his wife for 26 years and has three beautiful children. Can we stand to our feet, give a Faith Bible Chapel welcome to Pastor Eddie Rintz this morning. Pastor Kurt, man, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Oh, man, you can be seated. God bless you guys. I have been looking forward to this for so long because Faith Bible Chapel's reputation precedes you. you. You have no idea the reputation that you have as a church that's not only passionate for the Lord, but passionate for people. This church has, through generosity, has impacted so many lives around the world. And your reach has extended and made a gigantic difference in, in so many lives. And I just want to tell you thank you. In fact, on behalf of Hal Donaldson and the entire Convoy of Hope family, 
We cannot tell you thank you enough for trusting us and for giving to us so that you can help reach the world for Jesus Christ. We've helped over 100 million, preach the gospel to over 100 million. How many know that's a miracle? And we are so grateful to you because you're not giving to us. You give through us to change the world for Jesus. And I just want to say this to you, that God must love you a lot to give you your pastors here at this church, to give you Pastor Jason and Cheryl. You guys, God loves you a lot. And and to have the team, you can't do the ministry that's going on without the team. And and to be able to hang out with Pastor Kurt and his wife. and I mean, you have phenomenal people that serve you every week. And you are so blessed. And I, I just want you to know, God loves you a lot, thinks a lot about you. I am so honored to be able to be here. And I want you to know, I'm not here to impress you. I don't really honestly think and care if you think I'm a great speaker or not a great speaker, because you have a great pastor every week and a great team every week. What I care about is God showing up in the house and meeting us in a supernatural way, that God would be among us and that he would do something wonderful. You see, I shouldn't be standing here today. I'm a walking miracle. I have had two fathers who've committed adultery, walked out. My one dad was an alcoholic and an angry perfectionist. I was molested at six years old in a portable bathroom by a construction worker. Our home was a war zone. I grew up with a lot of pain and anger and hostility. And because of that, how many know when you're hurting, You look for other things to try to kind of numb the pain. And so at 13 years old, I turned to drugs and alcohol. I spent five years of my life hooked on drugs and alcohol. I was an athlete. God had blessed me. In fact, I had major colleges looking at scholarshipping me to play college football. I, uh, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, University of Washington. That's what I wanted to do, but my life was a mess. And at 19 years old, Walking down a si- on a sidewalk, God spoke to me. And God spoke to me. And how many know, he doesn't speak to you with anger or harshness or anything. He, he just said to me, son, aren't you sick of the life you're living? Aren't you tired of the sleepless nights? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, give me your life. I said, I can't because I can't stop what I'm doing. I, I can't quit. I was getting high in the morning, afternoon, evenings, because I was trying to numb the pain. And God spoke to me again, and he said, son, give me your life. And I said, but God, I can't quit. I can't do this thing. And he goes, don't worry about that. Give me your life. And for a third time, he said, said, son, give me your life. And I I said, God, okay, I'm going to give you my life. And right there on the spot, on a sidewalk, 19 years old, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, and God instantaneously delivered me from drugs and alcohol. I mean, set me free from drugs and alcohol. You know what the good news is? It doesn't matter how messed up your life is today. God is a good God. He's a big God, and he's still setting people free. So you may be running right now, but I have good news for you. He runs faster, and when you get tired, he's going to be standing there waiting for you with open arms because he loves you. He cares about you. So God, when I got delivered, set free, I went back to try to play football, and God said, son, you're not that good, and he called me to preach. And when I see what's happened to people, I'm like, thank you, God, because I'd be dead today, you know, the way those guys hit and what they do. So I just want you to know, I'm not here to impress you, but this is a special day today. This is one day to feed the world. This is where we take one day's wage And we say, God, we're giving it to you in order to change a world that desperately needs you. And I want to begin with a question. Is that okay? And I want you to be honest with yourself. I want you to ask yourself and answer this question. My number one goal in life is... My number one goal in life is... How would you answer that question? How would you respond to that? For some, your number one goal is to be happy. You want to be happy in life. There's nothing wrong with that. For others, your your number one goal is to be loved. If you're single in this room, maybe your number one goal is that you want to get married. You want to find somebody that you can spend your life with. 
For others, your number one goal may be to be successful in your career or to be somebody that makes a lot of money. Maybe it's to retire in comfort. Maybe it's to have fun or be well-known or be popular. But if you've never thought about that question, I would encourage you today to be honest with yourself that what is your number one goal in life, why does that matter? Because how you answer that question determines your dominant life value. It determines your dominant life value. In other words, it is what you will make decisions of based upon how you answer that question. Let me give you an example. If your dominant life value is to have fun and you get invited to go over to somebody's house tonight, maybe, maybe three couples in the church ask you to come over and hang out with them. If your dominant life value is to have fun, you're going to pick the home where you can have the most fun because that's your dominant life value. If your dominant life value is to live in safety, then you're going to choose the job or the life that is the safest. If it's to be comfortable, you're going to pick the path of the most comfort. If your dominant life value is to be well-known or to be, to be successful, if you need applause or recognition or affirmation, you're going to choose something that gives you the most applause, the most affirmation, the most uh, a, 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 a approval from others. In, Listen, church, every decision you make in life flows out of the answer to this one question, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. My number one goal in life is, well, what does God say about this idea? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, look at what it says. It says, let love be your highest aim. Would you say that with me? Let love be your highest aim. Not status, not comfort, not success, possessions, power, prestige. Let love be your highest aim. You should make that your highest priority in life. Why? Because God is love and God wants you to be like him. God is love and he wants you to be like him. Do you understand that God created everything in this universe because of love? Because he wanted to love it. He made everything in order to love it. You're here today not by accident. You're here today not by mistake. Your parents may not have planned on you, but God did. You're created in the image of Almighty God. And some people may say, you don't have value. You may look at yourself and have heard people say all your life, that you're not smart enough, good enough, that you're not, you're not going to be anybody, but I've got good news for you. You are somebody because you were created in the image of God and God loves you. You are the apple of his eye. You are his greatest desire in life. You are the object of his affection. The word doesn't tell us that God, that God has love. The Bible tells us that God is love. There's a big difference. God is is love and God wants you to be like him do you know that God has put you on this planet because he wants you to be like him he wants you to be just like him in life in fact life is all about learning how to love and how many know love is not easy I mean those that are married you know what I'm talking about Uh, It's not easy always to love because people get on your nerves. In fact, every one of us have EGRs in our life. Extra grace required. You know what I'm talking about. Those people, you might be sitting next to an EGR, and if you're not an EGR, then you are probably sitting by one. So, so you know what those are. EGRs are the people when they're coming your direction, you walk to the other side of the room because you know if you talk to them and stop, it's going to be a long, boring conversation. You're just like, oh, Lord, deliver me. Take me home right now. You know, how many know it's easy to love people that love you? It's easy to to love people that like you. But the challenge is loving people that aren't like you, that don't look like you, smell like you, act like you, dress like you, live like you. That's the hard part in life is that it's so difficult to love because people are messed up, aren't they? Life is messy. 
People are messed up, and it takes courage to love and to give love. Because love is not a feeling. Love is not a noun. Love is a verb. Love is action. Love is doing something. In fact, love is not love because you say it. Love is love because you do something. Love is not love because you go, oh, I love you so much. Oh, you're the most amazing person that there is. But you can get your own coffee. Love is not just a conversation. It is something you do. In fact, this was really important. Jesus was asked by uh, a gentleman who asked him, what is the greatest command in all the Bible? Look what Jesus said. You know this. It's in Mark chapter 12. But look at what it says. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second commandment is that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no commands more important than these. Would you say that with me? There is no commands more important than these. Jesus could have talked about don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie. But Jesus said that the two most important commands are that you love God and that you love others. That you love God and you love others. That's why I want you to know that love is and love does. Would you say that with me? Love is and love does. Look at your neighbor and say, love is and love does. Look at the other one with the attitude and say, love is and love does. You know what I'm talking about? That Jesus said these are the two most important. You know why? It's all about the vertical our love for God and the horizontal. Now in church, we emphasize so often the vertical, don't we? How to know God, how to walk with God, how to hear God, how to understand his word, and that's important. We need to understand the vertical, but we minimize many times the horizontal. And so we hold up people as being spiritual that have a great vertical relationship, but they're terrible horizontally. God said, I want you to love me, and I want you to learn how to love others. I want you to love me with all your heart, and I want you to love others with all your heart. Love them as you love yourself. Why did God ask us to love him and love others before we get to heaven? Why didn't he just take us home when we got born again? You know why? Because life is all about learning how to love. Life is learning how to love and how to be more like God. Oh, come on. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Why? Because love is and love does. Love is and does. And it's all about the vertical and the horizontal. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14. Would you read this out loud with me? Everything you do should be done in love. One more time. Everything you do should be done in love. Now, what does everything mean? Does that mean how you write your emails to others? How you respond on social media? How you handle situations with people? The Bible says everything we do should be done in love. Jesus modeled it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says, Jesus was moved with compassion. And there's a big difference between Pity and compassion. How many know that pity sees the need and feels the pain but never does anything? Pity will see what's going on and go, oh, I feel really bad about what's happening. I feel really terrible about the people around the world and what's going on, but they don't do anything. But compassion sees the need, feels the pain, but gets into the game. Compassion moves and responds. Why? Because everything we do should be done in love. Are you with me so far? There's a story in Acts chapter 9, verse 36. And this is what it says. Look at the scripture on the screen. It says, there was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in the Greek is Dorcas. She was always kind, doing kind things for others and helping the poor. So here's Tabitha. 
She's a person that cares about people around her in the horizontal. We know she loves God, but she's proving it by her response to others. So Tabitha's always doing kind things. If you read her life, you'll find out she made clothes for people, that she gave food to people, that she helped those that were hurting and broken. Tabitha was always doing good for others. And all of a sudden, Tabitha gets sick, and she dies. Her little church community is brokenhearted. They're grieving. They're mourning. They've lost a a matriarch, and they're they're sad because Tabitha's gone. And so they hear that Peter is in town. Simon Peter is in Joppa, and and so they send word, and they say, you need to come right now because because we, we need to tell you about Tabitha. They send for Simon Peter. He shows up, and everyone starts pulling out clothing and, and, and things that she's done. Look what she's made. Look what she's done. Look at the things that have happened. And they start telling Simon Peter the stories, and finally Simon goes, enough, enough. Everybody clear the room. And when everybody leaves, Simon Peter kneels down, and he prays for Tabitha, and she gets up from the dead. She rises up from the dead. So how many know if that happens in a city that the response is going to be amazing? In fact, verse 42 says, the news spread through the whole town and many believed in the Lord. How many think that in Arvada, if somebody got raised from the dead, all of a sudden people would be going, I'm going to Faith Bible Chapel because that church has something going on there. I I wanna be there just in case I have a heart attack. They can bring me back. I, I wanna be there. And so, so here's Tabitha, she comes from the dead, and when you read this story, you would think that the church grew because of people like Simon Peter, of people like Paul the Apostle, people like Timothy and others. You would think that the church grew because of them, but you would only be partially right. The truth is the church grew because of people like Tabitha. The the church grew because the local congregation realized who they were and the influence they they could have. The local church rose up and realized that if we get in the game and we begin to love God vertically and begin to love others horizontally, that we can change the world through Jesus Christ. We can make a difference. And so it was people like Tabitha that had an impact in what God was doing and the rapid growth of the church. In fact, if you study church history, you go back to A.D. 169, A.D. 260, during the Roman Empire, you will find out that plagues broke out. In fact, we're not sure what the plagues were, but they were either smallpox or they were measles. And it had such an effect in the Roman Empire that one quarter to one third of those that lived in the Roman Empire died. So you can imagine the fear that was happening there during that time. And when you look at the response between the pagans, the unbelievers, and you look at the Christ followers, they're two different stories. In fact, when you study history, this is the eyewitness account of of the response of the unbelievers. This is what it says. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest throwing them in the roads before they were dead. In other words, it didn't matter if you were family or not. If you were sick, they kicked you out. They tossed you in the street and said, we're not going to die. We're getting out of here. And so they got rid of them. But for the Christ followers, let me read you an eyewitness account of what was going on during the plagues. This is the response. Needless of danger, They took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them, and with them departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pain. Oh, church, how many know what a difference that is between the two? One is kicking others out and running for their life, and the other realizes the horizontal impact they can have, and they're stepping into the game, and they're loving people. Why? Because love is and love does. Love is and love does. And they had such an impact, the church exploded. Do you know that the church was making such an impact that the emperor Julian wrote his pagan priestess 
And he said to her, people are taking notice of how we're treating our poor. And they see that we're not responding to them. They see that we're not feeding them, that we're not taking care of them. But these Christians are doing that. And then Julian called them opportunists. He said, if we don't start doing something, those Christians are going to take over because they're opportunists. How many know we're opportunists, all right, for the kingdom of God? And we don't run from things. We step into things. Why? Because God said, I want you to be like me in this world. How many know we could change the world if we started having that kind of love for people that, that were in our neighborhoods or in the nations? We could change the world. The church began to explode. They talked about loving, and they did something rather than just spoke about it because love is and love does. I had the privilege to go to Sweden in 2016. I met a pastor, his name was Johannes, is Johannes, they, he has a great church in Sweden, and they are ministering to Syrian refugees. In fact, I don't know if you, some of you know from the news that Sweden has been inundated with Syrian refugees. At that time, over 150,000 refugees came into Sweden. 150,000. Sweden was like, we don't know what to do with these refugees. So the government started giving them hotels to live in. And, and one of those hotels, Johannes in his church saw that there were over 1,000 refugees living in that hotel. And so they said, what are we going to do? Because these are Muslims. How are we going to reach them for Jesus? We can't just preach to them. We have to we have to show them who God is. And so they began to pray and they decided that they were going to start meeting needs. So you know what they did? The church started showing up and they didn't talk about Jesus. You know what they did? They started doing manis and petties. They started doing free haircuts. They started bringing cookies over. They started teaching them about culture. And finally, people started asking, saying, why are you doing this? Why are, you, why are you coming to this hotel and doing all this stuff for us? And Pastor Johannes said, you want to know why? Come on Tuesday night and I'll tell you. And they started showing up and asking questions and he started sharing Jesus with them. And so here he is ministering to these Syrian refugees. And I met him in Pennsylvania and he said, he said, Eddie, do you think Convoy would like to help us with a Christmas party? We want to do a Christmas party for these refugees, and what we'd like to do is roll out the red carpet, we're going to give them food, and we're going to give the children toys because they're not going to have any toys for Christmas. Would you be interested? I said, you better believe that Convoy would be interested. And so we, we flew over to Sweden, and on the night of the banquet, I'll never forget this, they had rolled out the red carpet, literally. They had photographers there acting like paparazzi. You know, here are these refugees walking in, and they're just treating them like they're, they're special guests. The music's going, and, and it's going in culture, and they're having a great time. They're eating, and I get to do the Christmas story. Now, I'm an evangelist at heart, so that's like saying, you know, I'm going to give you a steak for free. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to let you do this. And so the whole time they're eating, I'm going, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I want to preach Jesus, so hurry up. And so I'm looking around the room, and finally it gets to my part, and I walk up, and my interpreter next to me is Iranian. And so I start telling the Christmas story, and I'm looking back and forth as I'm telling this story to over a thousand refugees, and he's crying. Tears are running down his face. God's presence shows up. It was like a fog that came in the room, and his presence shows up in the room. And at the end of the message, I did a simple Christmas story, and I gave a salvation call, and half of them gave their heart to Jesus Christ right on the spot. How many know God's a big God? And so after I get done, the, the interpreter hugs me. He's crying, and he won't let me go. He's crying, and he's saying in my ear, did you feel what I felt? Did you feel what I felt? Did you feel? I was like, yes, what did you feel? He said, God was here. 
And then he told me the story about how he's been a Muslim all his life, and he escaped barely with his life, but he couldn't get his family out. And so for two years, he got on his knees facing east five times a day, asking Allah to get his family out of Iran and bring them over to Sweden, and nothing was going on. And so Pastor Johanna started sharing the story of Jesus and as a healer and a deliverer. So one day he comes to him and he goes, hey, would you pray to Jesus for me? And would you ask Jesus if he would get my family out? And Johannes goes, yeah, absolutely. Seven days later. No, 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 let me try on this side. Seven days later, they get a visa they get out of Iran, and they're in Sweden. And, and this guy goes, I prayed all my life to Allah, and he never answered a prayer. And Jesus answered my prayer, and I want to follow this Jesus. And he changed, he turned his life over to Christ, and now is serving the Lord. Oh, church, that's what loving others is all about. Oh, you see what the enemy wants is he wants us to have a great time in these four walls, but he doesn't want us to realize who we really are, that we are not wimps, that we are not scared people that are hiding out in the corner going, oh no, that big, bad, ugly world is out there, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh no, you are children of the Most High God. You have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead on the inside of you, and it's not you that should be afraid of the devil. It's the devil that should be afraid of you realizing and recognizing who you are and how he has put his spirit on the inside. Okay, I'm sorry, but I've got my preach on now, so. And I can't help it. You know why? Because I believe, one person put it this way, love is what the deaf can hear and the blind can see. I visited Mother Teresa's Oh, man, I'm running out of time. Mother Teresa's home for the, the dead and dying in Calcutta, India, while she was living. I've had the privilege of preaching around the world to, to unsaved, lost people, and it's my greatest pleasure in life. And while I was there, I walked into her home of, uh, for those that are, that are near death, and they were laid out on these bamboo pallets, and all she wanted to do was give them a place of dignity in death. And someone asked Mother Teresa, said, why do you pick up these smelly, stinky, uh, 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 disease-ridden children and hug and kiss them? Why do you do that? And Mother Teresa said these words, when I pick up a child or a person who is near death's door, I'm picking up Jesus. And then I remembered Matthew 25 where God said, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the prisoner. And he said these words, if you do it, to the least you do it to me. He didn't say for me, he said to me. And Mother Teresa said, I'm doing this to Jesus every time. Oh church, we, we see many times the gospel just about preaching, but I want you to hear me. Yes, we need to preach the gospel. Yes, we need to proclaim the good news. But unless we begin to meet needs, they're not gonna be open to the good news. The Haitians say this, an empty stomach has no ears. In other words, if I'm starving and all you want to do is preach at me, what good is that? The greatest need today is hope. There's hopelessness in the world. Do you understand 16,000 children die every day with a lack of food, water, and nutritious food and clean water? So many people don't have hope today. My dad, who adopted me, was an alcoholic and a very angry person, took a handgun, successful businessman, shot and killed himself. 30 days later, his stepson, his son from another marriage who he'd run off with, another woman, took the same handgun, 18 years old, and took his life because of no hope. You can go 40 days without food. You can go three days without water. You can go eight minutes without oxygen, but you cannot go a single second without hope. The world is dying without hope. Every 30 seconds, a child is aborted someplace in the world. Every 40 seconds, someone commits suicide around the world. 80% of the world lives on $10 or less a day. 
One out of three have no access to clean water. In the last 100 years, 270 million have died in war. That's more than all the wars combined in history. In fact, in the last 100 years, more people have been martyred for their faith in the last 100 years than all of church history combined. One Christian is martyred every five minutes around the world. There's a need for hope. I want to close with a story in Bulgaria. Convoy of Hope has a refugee camp that's there. We have a little home called the Convoy of Hope Refugee Center. And at that center are Syrian refugees that have fled for their life. One of those, two of those there are Sonia and her daughter. Sonia is a young lady, a mom, who... ISIS came into their community, gathered up the entire village in the center square, and then stood up and said, anybody that's a Christian, step out in the front. And when they did, they said, reject Christ or die right here. Sonia, her mom, her husband, her brother, and her daughter all stepped to the front. The general looked at Sonia and said, reject Christ or die right here. Sonia said, I can't do that. Said then, then someone's going to die. And so they took her, her brother and right in front of them decapitated him. And then they looked at Sonia again and said, renounce Christ or, or die. She said, I can't do that. Tears running down her face, weeping. They grabbed her mother and they decapitated her. And then they, she again said no and they grabbed her husband and decapitated him but she still weeping and sobbing said i will not reject him so they sent in the next wave and they're the rapist and the rapist came in and they they were going to rape sonia and their daughter and the daughter flung herself in front of the mother and said don't hurt my mother don't hurt my mother screaming and something happened They decided not to touch her, and they actually released her and her daughter. It was a miracle. Sonia walked nine months with her daughter to Bulgaria. And there she stumbled upon the Convoy of Hope Refugee Center, where people like yourself have said love is and love does. We care. And Sonia, if you go to that Refugee Center right now, Sonia and her daughter are there, and every Sunday night they attend a worship service where refugees gather to worship God. And I want to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, because your one day wage that you give is changing the world. It's changing lives in disaster. It's changing lives with feeding. It's changing lives of agricultural farmers that are trying to get out of poverty. It's changing lives. And I want to tell you on behalf of those that can't stand here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to finish with this video and then Pastor Kurt's going to come and talk to you about today how you can help change the world with your one day's wage. I love you, God bless you. A lot of people think that the problem today is, is simply uh, food, water, poverty, but it's really hopelessness. As followers of Jesus Christ, uh, we ask a very important question. What is it that Jesus wants done? In partnership with people all over the world, what we're endeavoring to do is to transfer hope. When disasters strike, It is an amazing moment for the local church. When other people are fleeing, other people are leaving, uh, the local church is running to a disaster, running right into the middle of it. We want that community to look at the local church and say, when our community was hit hard, that church stepped up. And in the name of Jesus, they responded. They helped people. When people hear about children's feeding programs, immediately they think about just filling the stomachs of, of children and keeping them alive. And there's truth in that. But it actually goes beyond that. 
It's really about the safety of that child because if that child grows up and that child is either in the streets begging or that child is on a garbage heap scavenging for food, that child is not educated. That child becomes vulnerable to those who will prey upon those who are weak. We don't want to raise up a generation of weak children. We want to raise up a generation of strong children who can change their communities and change their countries. Some years ago, I went to a, a village in Haiti and um, it was barren. I, I mean, it was just all brown. There was nothing there. We had a gentleman from Washington State University, uh, Dr. Dirt, Jason Struble, that wrote a letter. And he said in that letter that he wanted to help communities come to life by helping them grow crops. And uh, so he joined our team. Uh, a few years later, when I went back to that same village, that same countryside, it was just full of life, it was lush. And that's what we've seen through Convoy of Hope all over the world. It's not just growing food so that people aren't hungry, it goes beyond that. It gives life to the entire community. When you think about 1.3 billion people living in poverty, and 70% of them are women, if we can empower the women, um, uh, statistics show that they're going to be more inclined to meet the needs of their family and to raise up the level, uh, the living conditions of their entire community. The thing that keeps me awake at night is uh, the thought of all the children and the women that are on our waiting list. We just haven't had the resources to bring them into the program. And um, yeah, that breaks my heart. Every day, every 24 hours, 16,000 children die from hunger and water-related causes every single day. That's a daily disaster. And that's what we're trying to respond to, to make sure that that number just is whittled down year after year, 16, down to 12, down to 10, down to five, down to one, and then a big zero. Amen. Can we thank Pastor Eddie for a great word this morning? And I want to tell you, this is, this is why we partner with Convoy of Hope. It is to meet the needs of people. It is to f put food in their bellies, but it's more than that. As he said, what Convoy of Hope does is it meets practical needs, but it meets real needs, spiritual needs, physical needs. You, when you give, and we do this together, Convoy of Hope is an extension of, of you that when people need a place to find refuge because they're persecuted for their faith, Convoy of Hope is providing that space for them. When they provide meals or when someone comes for help, they're going to hear the gospel. They're going to have their lives changed. And so Convoy of Hope f feeds people, but it meets all the other needs that are there. And so that's why we partner with them. And this is not a partnership that just happens once a year. I want to let you know, Pastor Jason and Cheryl were just with the leadership for the last week. Uh, listening to them dream and vision cast and talk about the great things that they have for the future. But also Pastor Jason and Cheryl with some of the elders, they've traveled to the Philippines. They've seen the feeding centers there. They've seen the work that they're doing with women. They see the work that they're doing with children. They are invested. We as a church are invested in doing all that we can to reach the entire world for the sake of Jesus. And this is one of those ways. And we get to be a conduit for that. And as, as leadership of the church, we want to make sure that you understand that every investment you're making in Convoy of Hope, you're going to see return on an investment that you wouldn't believe because of the lives that you get to change and the changes you get to make in the world because of what you're doing through Convoy of Hope. And so as we give this offering today, this offering, 100%, every single penny that is given today in this offering goes 100% to Convoy of Hope. And so I'm going to ask, would you just stand with me? I'm going to ask the ushers, would you please make your way down? We're going to sing some worship music, but man, would you, would you give a day's wage to this group? Maybe God's calling you to give a little bit more than a day's wage, but can you give whatever you can give just as in the stories of the Bible where they gave even a little, even like the boys' lunch, and it became so much greater? Because what we want to do is we want to continue to partner with Convoy of Hope as they go out to the world that we can give just the name of Jesus to one person and watch it spread throughout the world because of what they're doing. And so if you want to give 
Today, you can give cash, check, you can give online. You can just say Convoy of Hope in the memo line, make any check out to Faith Bible Chapel because what we'll do is we'll take everything and we'll give one large check uh, to Convoy of Hope together as a church. This is you doing the work of God and so we're gonna continue to support Convoy of Hope, not just one day of year, but we're gonna continue to partner so that we can reach the whole world outside of Arvada, amen? Amen. Well, ushers, can we just go ahead and start passing? Let's continue to worship together as we give to the Lord.